The USDA recently launched a pilot program that's going to allow local or independent cattle processing facilities the ability to get official USDA grading remotely. It's always great talking with the working ranch family. Well, I'll tell you what, this latest news that come out regarding the USDA doing this pilot program on remote. More affordable and more better access to Leah Biondo and Patrick Robinette with U.S. Cattlemen's Association joins me today as we talk about the details of this pilot program, how it came about, how it's going to function, and why they believe it's going to be a major game changer for so many of us in the cattle industry. Cattle to one of the big guys. Mm-hmm. Patrick, I want to go to you. As Leah was saying, you're going to give us a little bit more Who benefits from remote grading in the cattle industry. Listen in as we learn about the details and what it means to us as beef producers on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. And we welcome you back here again to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills, your host. and Glad to have you tune in and joining us on our program today. By the way, if this is your first time tuning in, I want to tell you that if you do hear something today, you want to go back and listen to it again. It's pretty simple. You can go to our podcast site at workingranchradio.com or any podcast provider out there. You can download it from there as well. If you're listening via podcast, well, we appreciate you taking the time to download and tune in. And if you like what you hear, let your friends know let your neighbors know let us know as well like it leave a comment we sure appreciate that that also helps me to kind of know if we're heading the right direction with the content of our programs as well now don't forget to stay tuned through the entire show as meteorologist don day will be joining us as we take a look at our long-term weather so we've got a lot packed in for today's show well let's jump into our subject and let me just say i did not realize what we were dealing with in terms of potential impact to our industry until I had my conversation with our guests here today. And I think you're going to find that out for yourself as well. So with that, let's introduce our guest today. Joining us, Leah Biondo, who's the Executive Vice President of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, and Patrick Robinette, who is the Chair of the Independent Beef Processors Committee for USCA. He is out of North Carolina, but on the road today in Oregon. Guys, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Appreciate you you having us on here, Justin. It's always great talking with the Working Ranch family. Well, I'll tell you what, this latest news that come out regarding the USDA doing this pilot program on remote grading, it was kind of exciting to hear about. And Leah, I'm not going to stutter around and and carry on with what all uh, happened with that. I want you to kind of give us the breakdown on, on that press release and that information that came out from the USDA. Yeah, Justin, so this is big news, and we're very lucky to have uh, Mr. Robinette here with us today to break it down into things that we can come away from this podcast with. But um, the news is that the USDA has announced a pilot program. So a pilot program, you know, we're testing the waters, we're making sure this program works, we're making improvements to it, but a pilot program for a USDA AMS remote carcass grading program. And like I said, Patrick's going to dive into the details here, but this concept, this idea of allowing independent processors more affordable and more better access to uh, grading opportunities is going to open up so many doors for independent processors, independent producers, local cattlemen, regional cattlemen. It's it's going to be huge and it's really going to impact the marketplace because historically these programs have only really been available at an affordable and accessible price to the big four packers. And so now bringing this program to the independent processors and the regional processors, this is going to allow producers to access some of those branded beef programs like certified Angus beef. And you won't have to uh, send your cattle to one of the big guys. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I want to go to you. As Leah was saying, you're going to give us a little bit more of the technical details. We'll get into that as we go through our program here today. But initially, just your thoughts right off the bat as chair of the Independent Processors Committee for uh, in this working on this on behalf of producers yours just your initial thoughts coming out of it yes sir this is a it's earth shaking and it is going to be a market disruptor to the big four as leah said earlier just a second ago the only access to grading has been to the big four 
And that's been this way for the last 20, 30 years. And the way that this all came about was us meeting with AMS about another issue. And once we solved that, I said, yep, now I'm not satisfied. Now we got to talk about grading. Mm -hmm. And this has been a three-year process because they first took the data that I gave them to say, yes, Patrick, this is a one-off. And then they found out this is really is an issue across the country. And then, you know, building the program from there. But for the first time ever, the cattleman does not have to give up their rights and their margins to their animals. Mm -hmm. That it, that anybody can have graded beef at this point in time. Yeah. Well, and as, as we were talking before we went on air, just the fact that this is really, and, and you both have stated this, I'm not to try to restate what you've already said, but it's a big win for producers. Many of folks that have really tried to market their own product uh, off the farm to the plate, this is a big win. Correct. You know, we've we've been direct marketing our cattle for 24 years. And like when I go to a restaurant and chef goes, well, I buy choice ribeye. And for 24 years, I've had choice ribeyes in my hand, but legally I couldn't say a word about it. And just by not having that word in my on my label has stopped restaurants, grocery stores from buying from me. Mm -hmm. Now I can put that word on that label and give credit to the carcass that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really, I think for a lot of folks, you have to see, you think, think through this and it starts to sink in and you realize how, how important this was. I want to talk a little bit, uh, as I said, we'll talk technical details coming up in the next segment, but let's talk about this being a pilot program. Where's this going to be piloted at? <laughs> Nationwide. So what what occurred was uh, it was supposed to have rolled out to just 16 facilities across the country so that the concept could be that they had put in like did test runs on. Let's just put it in practice, but in a control practice. And uh, the the Biden administration announced to roll it out and they did it being done at the stockyard. It was really targeting the cattlemen's uh as constituents, um, but it's nationwide. And the the uniqueness about this, and as Leah stated, it's a pile is being identified as a pilot for the simple fact there's going to be some some altercations done as as this is in practice. There's going to be some adjustments that are going to have to be made. But the fun part about it is unscheduled grading has already been accounted for in in all the budgets. So as long as the cattlemen and the processors follow the rules this is this is our new way of life mm -hmm. if we go back grading started in 1916 and it was the usda every facility had a grader and an inspector on their facility at their facility and as a way for the usda to provide a uh, customer confidence to meats that they were buying sometime in the in the late 40s is when it became a, a charge and then over time those animals that were going to those independent processors were diverted to the big four. And so that's where it became, the cost became ineffective. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. us going to the USDA AMS to, to discuss this issue, it was brought up. How, why are we operating off of a, over a hundred year old policy and operational procedures with today's technology not being included? Yeah. So that was the basis of the whole Mm -hmm. conversation that began this whole process yeah that's for sure there's a lot and there's there's probably a lot of things that are in our u.s industry cattle industry that are a little bit antiquated in some of this kind of stuff we've got just a couple minutes here before we head to break leah just back to you real quick uh and i know patrick is the chair of that committee you working uh, on behalf of u.s cattlemen's in in dc there just the starts of these conversations and working through this, how amenable was it in working with the USDA to get this through? How willing were they to work with you on this? Right. And and that's a great question. You know, in 2020, uh, the Independent Beef Processing Committee with Patrick as the chair, they created this idea, this concept as a policy resolution. So if you think about it in this context of uh, 
the the slow wheels of bureaucracy, you know, that's it, it was relatively quick working with them from conception to implementation. And of course, here we're just talking about a pilot program. But if we can show success, if we can show that this is providing value to producers and processors, maybe we can get Congress to create a more permanent program with more permanent funding. So, you know, USDA, they're, they're searching for ways to create a fair, more competitive marketplace. They have a senior advisor in USDA that reports directly to the White House. Uh, he's a senior advisor for fair and competitive markets. Um, so they have people on staff right now, the Biden administration does, that's looking for angles, looking for ways to increase the market share for independent producers and processors. And it's not just for us. Selfishly, it's for consumers. Uh, for them, you know, consumers are, are voting constituents just as much as independent producers are. And so they want to see cost of prices for food go down. They want to see store uh, grocery store shelves stocked in, in emergency situations. And so creating a more resilient, more independent, more sovereign food supply system is is really a, a good political value for them as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Well, guys, let's take a break here. When we come back, we're going to start talking some of the technical details of this latest coming out from the USD on this remote grading and what it means. We'll continue into looking a little bit more in depth about what it means to us as ranchers here in the countryside as well. My guest today, Leah Biondo and Patrick Robinette with U.S. Cattlemen's Associations. This segment today brought to you by Diamond V, Natural Amendment immune support postbiotic feed additives because your animal's health deserves a healthier approach. Find out more at diamondv.com. We'll be back after this. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, Feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit DiamondV.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. We'll continue on here in just a bit with our conversation with Leah Biondo and Patrick Robinette of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. But first, I want to remind you that coming up on the 3rd of February, Stockman Source Beef Bulls will be having their sale. As you heard last week, if you joined us on our program, we had a conversation with both Jeremy Martin and Travis Christman, partners in that bull sale, about their program and what they're doing. Uh, bulls that are raised in the range environment that not going to melt on you, breeding for battle balance and performance in what they're doing on there and if you want to find out more about what all they've got going on and take a look at their catalog hey you don't have to be in nebraska that's where they're headquartered out of but you don't have to be from nebraska to buy these bulls you can be anywhere in the country it's going to be carried on dv auction their website if you want to download a catalog or view the video on these bulls ssbeefbulls.com that is the website now that sale will be held again february 3rd at jeremy and gail martin's ranch which is just southwest of north platte nebraska about 35 miles or so they'll get started with the viewing at noon and this is central time and then the sale will get started with their cowboy auction on dv auction at 3 p.m february 3rd for stockman source beef bulls they're going to be selling about 160 head of bulls 35 head of those going to be angus coming two-year-old bulls and then the rest of those 100 about 125 head will be sim angus bulls most of those coming too there's going to be a few 18 month old bulls in there as well so check them out ssbeefbulls.com is the website that sale is going to be february 3rd three o'clock central time you can also catch that on DV Auction. Well, as we continue on now, my guest today, Leah Biondo, who's Executive Vice President of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, and Patrick Robinette, who is the Chair of the Independent Beef Processors Committee for USCA. Uh, Patrick, I want to go to you now. You've been working on this, as we heard in the previous segment. Uh, you guys have been working on this and, and, and finally get this pilot program through on this remote grading system. Now, let's talk some of the technical details of this and what that means how this is going to happen. Yes, sir. So it's as simple as the processor will make a cut between the 12th, 13th rib, expose the rib by face, take out his or her phone, take a picture of that face with a tag, you know, uh, identification tag on it. Then take a second picture with the rib by grade uh, grid uh, chart, upload the pictures, to this dedicated cloud account. 
Currently, the grader that's going to be assigned to doing this work is located in Nebraska. He would download the pictures. He would make the, the determination, fill out a report, and send it back. And at that point in time, the processor can then apply that grade to that label. And this is for all state and federal inspected facilities. Okay. Regarding the details of this from a technical standpoint, so will there be a stamp on that carcass or, or will they have that or is that, how does that yes, work? Sir. Yep. So the uh, USDA MS is providing the plastic grid chart and then the grade stamps and they'll send them to the plant. The FSIS will be responsible for maintaining control of the stamps. And so, you know, ultimately FSIS is going to, okay, these carcasses are graded choice. So, you know, make sure that the proper grade was assigned to the proper carcasses. But yes, they'll have a stamp put on the carcass. So let's say that it's a state or, or federal inspected facility and they don't, they do not do retail cuts. Let's just say they break it down to primers. They'll be able to put the stamp on the carcass and then that stamp would then follow that primal to wherever its destination being cut is located. Then if the plant does break down the, the carcasses, they'll be able to roll that data of that grade and then apply that grade to the label. And it could be, and there's different versions. Uh, some facilities have print on site labels. So then they just be able to insert the word into that, or they'll be able to print prime choice select or the other grades be able to print it on a separate sheet of uh, like a separate sticker or a separate sheet of paper and then slide it into the package of meat. And so then that grade will then be expressed to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So just a couple things as as we're going through this, as you were sitting down and working through the details of this from a technical standpoint with the USDA, I'm sure there had to be some concern of the integrity of that stamp and the integrity of that process going on. Was there, was there discussion revolving around that? Oh yes, sir. There was a lot of discussion on that. You know, as cattlemen, we just were great at, yeah, I was like, you know, let's try to work around the system. Right. And so that was the number one issue that USDA had, you know, AI grading, or camera grading has been allowed in the plant since this, since, you know, since this came along, but the rules stated that a physical grader had to be on site in order for that to be utilized. And so what is that, what we've determined uh, how to do this is the, the, the producer or the processor is going to have to use a smartphone, whether it's an Android or a, or an iPhone doesn't matter. And they're going to have to leave their location service that's turned on so that when they take the picture, then at that point in time, there is a metadata that is distinct to that individual picture so that they would be able to determine whether, you know, let's say they're taking the same picture of the same carcass, they're going to be able to get that right away. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as I'm hearing this too, a lot of information and tracking of information has to be a part of this process as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we discussed through Calame is you got to tag these animals because there has to be an identification. Uh, there'll be an identification. Then that identification passes over to the carcass. And then that carcass tag will then be part of this picture. So both pictures with the with the grid chart and the, the ribeye face itself will have to have that the tag in the picture. And so it would have the date. It would the date of the, the carcass was uh, harvested. It would have a number assigned or some sort of a tagging system, whatever the plant uses uh, for identification of animal. And then it would have, uh, you know, a hot carcass weight on there too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the USDA is tracking, you know, well, how many pounds of choice and so like, they're like, they're going to do a lot of analytics in the background there with the data they're collecting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we think that the procedures that have been put in place will protect against the bad actors, but the bad actors will be spotted pretty fast. You like bet. they're, it, it will be fixed in a hurry. Yeah. Well, and I, that's the case in any situation, probably in any of these. Right. Um, the next thing I would address would be the cost of this. Uh, I know in the press release that I read, there was significant savings for producers that say, say I just Joe Rancher out here wanted to go sell a product that would have a USDA grade label stamp on it that would say prime choice or select that's a pretty big cost for me to endure versus this that has this remote access element that's pretty significant let's ex let's talk a little bit about the cost in this yeah so again 
everything was, you know, the, everything was put in theory, right? Mm-hmm. And so there is a, there is a set amount of time that a grader are physically great. And then, so that goes to that, you know, that, that unscheduled grading fee of $114 an hour. But then there was a figuring on that, well, you know, the, the, the grader has to physically download the pictures and then we'll have to physically write a report and then physically upload the report back to the processor or get on the phone. Maybe the picture is, is kind of blurry or, you know, maybe they're, you know, hey, we need to get another picture to debate. Maybe it's on the borderline between two grades. And so they, so they're, they accounted for that time. And so what was determined was doing this initially as a slot. So I believe it's from one to 12 head would be counted as 30 minutes of unscheduled grading. Now, the way we got to look at this, if I'm a processor and I submit one carcass to be graded in a week, it's going to be $52. If I'm submitting 12, it'll be $4.56. Okay. Yep. The, the issue is there's some concern that, you know, that some people are going to be, you know, the cost is going to be higher and, and others. Well, that's going to get down into processor management. Nobody says that the moment you, you harvest that animal, you have to take that picture for that grade. Many of these processors are holding on these carcasses for 14 to 21 days. So you can actually combine two to three oh, harvest sure. week. Mm-hmm right? Mm-hmm. And then submit all the grades at one time. Or maybe you're a processor and you say, okay, I'm going to offer grading the first week of the month. Mm-hmm. That way then they're, they're driving all the animals because the only cost to the processor that the processor is then going to pass down to the producer will technically be only when he submits photos up to 100 carcasses a week. Mm-hmm. And so that's his only billing. And so there is some work that's going to have to be done through the processor in how to manage it, you know, and mitigate that, that expense. So we're, you know, the best and the end of each, uh, each range of the number of head, it, the lowest amount is, is $4 and 36 cents. But there is the possibility that a processor, you know, with just one carcass graded and it'll be high, way higher than that. Now, we're thinking through evaluation of how much premium is not being assigned to these carcasses by saying just ribeye or just sirloin versus choice fine select. They've kind of figured that there's about a $300 plus head premium that can be assigned to it. Mm-hmm. Again, the squishiness about it is, is a person a good marketer to be able to, to drive that price point into what they're charging but overall across the united states would be about 300 dollars premium so even if you're being charged that 52 dollars, you're still making a heck of a premium over what you were doing yesterday yeah you know patrick as we were talking about that do you think and maybe you already mentioned that maybe that was what you were talking about a little bit i want to just kind of clarify do you think that independent processors are just going to say, hey, we're going to offer a grading system. Do you want it graded yes or no? When they send a bunch of pictures in for evaluation, it's going to be you and 30 other or 25 other you know, say, say I'm just a guy wanting one done, you know, for example, like this morning, I just come back from Belfu, South Dakota, picking up a beef there. And it'd be kind of interesting to know what's my beef grading. Right. And that's exactly right. It literally, there's, it's really going to come down to um, processor management. Now, mm-hmm. here's what I'm going to say. I, and, I, and I hate to say this, but I actually had an experience of this. Unfortunately, there are processors that are going to say, I'm not doing one more thing. Yeah. Okay. So it literally, the producer needs to go to processor. Hey, this remote grading is available. I want to take advantage of it. If the processor says no, fine, I'm going to go find me another processor. Mm-hmm. Because we're always going to get down into the world of somebody is hungry for some more business. Somebody, you know, what some processor is going in the, in that area, we'll end up doing it. And so we, and that's where in the, in the conversations with AMS, it literally came down to, in my determination, not, not theirs, but in my determination, it really comes down to this is a program that is going to be solely producer driven. Mm-hmm on how much is being done. 
Yeah, I can absolutely see see that and how it's being piloted or just the conception of it as well. Let's take a break here, guys. And when we come back, let's talk about the four groups that this is going to impact. Of course, we know as ranchers, there's going to be some impact with us, but just we'll dive a little deeper into that uh, amongst in within the industry as well. My guest today, Leah Biano, Patrick Robinette with the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. This segment brought to you by the American Gelby Association. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelby and balance genetics find out more at gelvy.org we'll be back after this capitalize on crossbreeding with gelv and balancer bulls raise replacement females with added fertility increased longevity and greater productivity gelv and balancer influenced females wean more pounds of calf per cow exposed in the feed yard, balancer influenced cattle offer increased performance, improved feed efficiency, and have excellent carcass merit. Balancers add the pounds, make the grade, and deliver the value. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelb V and Balancer Genetics. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. We're talking about the pilot program that's now uh, kicked out. USDA announced this uh, latter part of January uh, down in Denver at the uh, National Western Stock Show. And it was uh, remote grading where working with independent beef processors where they can get uh, USDA graded beef. Uh, our guest today, Leah Biondo, Patrick Robinette with U.S. Cattlemen's Association. I do want to get into the the groups that will impact. Uh, as we were talking before we went on air, I really saw that some folks that try to direct sell their product is really going to give some benefit to them. Let's talk about these groups that it's going to impact the most. And either one of you, Patrick or Leah, whoever wants to start on this. So, I classified it in the four different groups. So the media group let's just, is, the, is the independent processor. Um, I'm over here in uh, Baker City, Oregon, and, and next town over is LeGrand, and there's a, a Jake Hines has a, a facility. I'm actually meeting with Jake right now. And Jake has a facility in, in the facility, but he also has a retail shop. Jake can now have a label that has a grade on his product and then that consumer who is looking for that grade doesn't have to go to the grocery store now to be able to see it. And so that's the, that's the first group. And it's the immediate group. Those, those processors that have those retail shops, they are, they're equal. They are now have market equality to the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. The second group, and this is going to be our largest uh, demographic group will be the producers, the cattlemen, women, who are direct marketing their, the beef that they raise. Again, up to now, all they could say is ribeye steak or ribeye roast. Now they're going to be able to put a grade on that, on the product. You know, I, I'm sure somebody's out there going to be able to prove me wrong, but I don't think on this case, I don't know of a single farmer's market in anywhere in this country that has a graded beef opportunity or option on, you know, in their stand. Mm -hmm. And so now they're going to be able to have, again, a word equal to the grocery store. And how many of these farmer's market people uh, walk around and they're buying their produce or buying flowers or buying spices, and then they go to the grocery store buying meat because they're looking for that word because that word meant that I had a good experience. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to be able to have those words on those labels in those markets or even those producers that are direct marketing to the um the food service market or the independent grocery market. The third group are the seed stock producers. You know, currently seed stock producers, when they sell their, you know, they sell the uh, heifers, bred cows or uh, breeding bulls, and they have genetic papers. On those genetic papers, there is a side on there for EPDs on meat quality, right? Mm -hmm. And so what their, their animals have been going, been sold to other producers. And then in order for them to collect that data back, they have to rely on those producers to track those calves all the way through the system, retrieve the data back after the feed yard, and then send it back to them. They can now have a diversified program diversify their operation to be able to say, okay, we have a seed stock operation, but we also have our own beef operation and then be able to capture that immediate data and not rely on somebody else to give it to them. Yeah. Also going back up to now, the producer that let's say the producers that have an Angus cattle 
those producers, in order to be able to stay certified ingots, have to go to Big Four, and then the Big Four get the margins. Because of that grid, that ribeye grid picture that's going to be taken, now the evaluation, okay, I have an angus cattle. I can prove it was angus. I can prove it. It met a grade. I proved that it had a ribeye dimension. Now they can say certified angus beef on their label. Mm-hmm. And now it says Cisco U.S. Foods capturing the premiums of certified angus in these food service uh, houses. Now the food service houses, those, those restaurants don't have to go through U.S. Foods or Cisco. They can go directly to the cattle. Mm-hmm. The fourth tree is going to be the feed yards. Now, again, I'm sure there's going to be some blowback. Yeah. But I feel pretty certain the, the feed yards that are, that are being truthful will would be agreeing with me. Even though we've had an improvement in our feed rations and, we're, and we've got more efficient and feeding, all these feed yards are feeding for great. And, but I don't believe truthfully that they have, that they have calculated the improvement of genetic into their herds. And I believe that they're overfeeding 10, 15% because they've already achieved that grade. You know, once you achieve prime, you're, you're prime. You get it. There's no more, right? Yeah. But yeah. they have overfed those animals. Mm-hmm. They kept, they kept piling feed, but they weren't getting anything else. I don't know if a single one of these feed yards that doesn't have some sort of a meat locker program for their friend, family, employee, and so they'll be able to pull their animals out of the, you know, get a represent sample out of a pen, mm-hmm. take it to a state of federal inspected facility, have a grade of fine. Somebody said that once you have a grade of fine, you have to sell that meat. Sure. You can yeah. give that meat away. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Yep. Working within your program already, you know, your meat locker program already, but now you know. Before you before you go off and market that pen, you kind of have a good idea about what that pen's going to yield in grade, mm-hmm. and you're going to be able to stop once you see. Okay, shoot, I got you know, I got a pen of a hundred, and I pulled out five, and now the five three were prime. Oh well, I I about maximized this, that issue here, you know, the the pen here. Like I can stop feeding, go ahead and get these uh, animals out of here. Mm-hmm. Like this is like this is serious economical changes go, that that that's going to impact the, the cattle you know producers. Yeah, when you say that that it's a serious change, it it, it I foresee it really. I I mean you're right. I see that because the yeah. fact that it that as you talked about the four different groups that it can affect from the beef processors to the largest demographic being producers, seed stock producers, and then feed yards. That's a pretty good segment of our cattle industry that our family yeah, ranching operations yeah. and various family businesses. It, this is a, this and could be a big turn. And the only person up to today for the last 20, 30 years, the only person that has been able to capitalize on those, on those premiums has been the big four. And that, you know, and, and they passed some of the premium down. Let, let's not, I mean, it's yeah. not, it's not total, but they passed some of it down, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They give us food scraps, right? Now, and, and ultimately what this should do, you know, we had a big, you know, we, we joke, well, we don't joke. It's been serious about that, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, the, the animals that migrated out, these independent processors, they've been starving for animals. They, they migrated away because, you know, we can get, you know, we can get the premium, you know, some premium out of the big four and, 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 you know, the convenience of, you know, old tractor trailer trucks going away. Okay. And then 2020 hit. And then all of a sudden people like me, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, now you're my friend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but we've also seen an erosion of that because the cow didn't realize there's a little work involved in direct marketing beef. I'm going to try to move a whole animal and be done with it. Right. Yeah. But ultimately because of the increase, because you're not going to get the scrap of the premium, you're going to get the whole premium. This is going to drive more animals back to the independent producer. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, as we're making all these major investments in these independent processors to be built across America, now we're getting these animals, you know, uh, uh, the sustainability of the animals driving back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot to, lot to digest there. And I really encourage folks to just think through this. Think 
through some of the things that we just talked about, and I think you'll understand the dynamics of what we're talking about here. We've got one more segment, Leah Biondo, Patrick Robinette with the U.S. Cattlemen's Association as we're talking about the remote beef grading system uh, pilot program that's out now and the details of what that means. We're going to continue on some final comments when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show as we're exploring the release that come out from the USDA regarding their remote grading pilot program that's out there. Uh, my guest today, Leah Biondo, Patrick Robinette with the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Patrick is the chair of the Independent Beef Processors Committee. And as we sort of wrap this conversation up in the last segment, you talked about the different groups that it's going to affect. Real quick, just one thing about this. Uh, you had said one of those groups being beef processors, which of course is who you represent represent and you've got an experience in that also direct selling your own products as well as a rancher yourself but Patrick from a processor standpoint when you had addressed COVID in the previous section as well and how that really changed some of the dynamics within our cattle industry as well we did see more money invested in either a buildup of some of these family small beef processing operations or some new ones being built it's putting these guys on the same footing as the big ones. Yes, sir. You know, we, you know, in, again, USDA was uh, instrumentally involved in, in the money that uh, was allocated out for the increase of uh, the expansion and the increased capacity of uh, meat and poultry processing. And the one thing that I always will always threw out there was that you could throw all the money at the world at this whole problem. But if the producer does not bring their animals to that process or the person who has made that investment to be, you know, to be there on his behalf, then this means absolutely nothing because they'll go play. Mm-hmm. And so again, this will be a tool that in the processor can add to their daily life. And again, it, it creates that other reason why these cattle could be driven to their location instead of going to the big four. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, the nearest fat cattle fodder is really in Tennessee, and I'd have to drive seven, eight hours. Yeah. Versus if I didn't have a mile facility instead of going 30 miles down the road. Like there's a whole dynamic of changes here, but it does. It gives that independent processor a level playing field with the big four. Now, the big four does get the grading out at a little cheaper price. And that's the piece that in the pilot, you know, as I told AMS, the people at AMS, I was grateful for what we've done, but let's not stop working. Yeah. Let's keep shrinking so that we can get this that even, you know, on the even playing field. Yep. Well, it's a big step in the right direction. There's no question about that. I know as everybody's listening to this, the thoughts are going through my head is that boy it reopens that potential door of looking at direct sale off your ranching operation maybe you've looked at it before and you thought well you know and from that standpoint that's where folks need to look out and seek some assistance and some of that there's folks that have been doing that that know how to do that have been there and done that sort of thing the department of ag in each of the respective states probably have some assistance with all of that let's talk a bit about that yeah, so each of your state agriculture departments has a, a, a department or agency that can handle this request. Mm-hmm. Another avenue to go through is USDA's Meat and Poultry Processing Technical Assistance Program, so NPPTA. Okay. And um, USDA has allocated, I think, you know, like $25 million to several different organizations and groups to be able to provide you with technical assistance so they can help with applying for a federal grant they can help with uh, financial planning business planning Uh, they can help with workforce development they can help uh, support you as you develop uh, relationships with processors suppliers distributors customers so go check out that that's the usda meat and poultry processing technical assistance 
program. Well, that's a mouthful, um, Leah. <laughs> it is a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> um, an easier one might be to look up the Flower Hill Institute. That's flower is in floral, hill is in not a mountain, an institute. Flower Hill Institute, uh, U.S. Cattlemen's Association is partnered with. Um, so we've been referring a lot of our members over to them for technical assistance. I'd also recommend ch- checking out the Chop Local Marketplace. They've got a great course out right now on selling meat online direct to consumer. So you can go, you can get your uh, branded beef certification and you can sell directly to consumers using their online marketplace. So uh, okay. no upfront designing on your end. Yeah. Uh, and folks too, real quick, I will put these links to those sites that Leah mentioned in the show notes as well on our podcast page. So you can quickly find those. Patrick, I know you said you'd been direct selling for quite some time. What's your thoughts as far as the technical assistance and seeking that out? Yes. So not going to paint a rosy picture. It's not a for the paint a heart because I mean, you are competing against the big four. You are competing against Cisco U.S. food, but it can be done. I was out visiting a feed yard in Oregon and another one in Idaho. And we were having this discussion and uh, that's one of the topics we were discussing. And I was like, you know, somebody else has been telling our story, but we all individually have a story. Here's a, there's a family, it's a Bingham cattle company out of uh, Oregon. And they have a really, really, really cool story. Whenever you, you talk about their, their family legacy, their, their history, and they market right now about 50 head a year. Uh, they have a pen uh, available for over a thousand head. Wendy Bingham is saying, wait a second, I can, I can expand here. But there's a lot of work. There's a lot of education you know, getting from the cattlemen. The, the cattlemen need to quit saying that they market steers and heifers, and they need to start saying we market beef. And, and, and when you take that mentality and you, and, and you shift it there, every steer and every heifer from the day it's born has a brisket. It has a weight. It, you know, and as that animal grows, that weight grows. And so learning what your genetics does, learning what your meat quality does is, uh, learning when to, when to harvest in, like in my case in North Carolina, is not, uh, beneficial for me to get them to that 14, 1600 pound part mark. I need to get them down to 1183 to 1200 mark. Learning all of that will shift your operation, become more efficient, become a bigger profit center, and then start diving in into moving the cut. Uh, moving the roads, moving the primals, but you will be able to tell your story. Somebody won't be telling it for you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the challenges with the age of the cattlemen, the average age of the cattlemen. You know, we had it when we started this 24 years ago. My final law didn't even have a computer in his house. How were we going to talk about social media and, you know, or even talk about e-commerce and teach them how to use the computer? At the same time, my daughter's teaching me, my daughter and son are teaching me how to use AI. So like there's new tech, there's new technology that even I'm not familiar with. And, but I mean, you've got to be willing to learn. And as Leah was referencing, we, there are all these, there's a bunch of organizations across the country that if you just reach out and say, look, I don't understand, please help. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there for. Yep. And so, you know, and so this is, it's going to be just, it'll be, it'll be initially a little bit of work, but I'll use examples for the, you know, had a, a direction where about every calf ran out of their state. And now within majority of their operations, they hold back a percentage of calves and they've diversified their operation. And my God, what would the world would really look like if, if all the cattlemen had a diversified operation in 2020? Instead of me getting the phone call when the when the big four were shutting down, hey, 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 my pens are backing up and I'm starving. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. But if you already had a diversified operation, you would have been, hey, I'm still kicking. You know, I'm still moving forward. We need to quit being relying on one person on my living. We need to, you know, diversify. And so it's going to be a little bit of a, of a time period of adjustment here um, because of this remote grading option, but it can be done and the margins will go in your pocket and you're, and that's the biggest thing. You're going to be able to tell the story, the history, the legacy. Here's why I've done what I've done. And we're not going to be relying on somebody else to get it right. 
You bet. All right. Well, uh, Leah and Patrick, appreciate you guys taking the time out here. I know you both are busy and uh, Patrick, you're on the road. Leah, you're busy as, as always uh, back in Washington working on things like this. A good step in the direction for the producers, the ranchers here in the countryside. Thanks for your work. and Appreciate you guys being here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you. You bet. And again, my guest today, Leah Biondo, Executive Vice President of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, and Patrick Robinette, who chairs the Committee of Independent Beef Processors for USCA. A lot of great information there. Now, like I said before, uh, if you go to the podcast information of this show, I will put all of the links to the websites that we were talking about as well. So be sure to check that out. Stay with us. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, meteorologist Don Day is going to be joining us as we take a look at this long-term weather and long term this time of the year might be a stretch he's going to talk about that when we return on the working ranch radio show fascinated by our wild weather now you can learn appreciate and understand the weather in your own backyard with the new tropo rain gauge having achieved the highest rating of any product reviewed by the weather station experts.com the tropo boasts rugged durability impeccable accuracy and precision to the hundredth of an inch visit measurerain.com to order a tropo today and use code rain day that's r-a-i-n-d-a-y for free shipping and 10 percent off go to measure rain.com welcome back to the working ranch radio show i'm kind of chuckling as we come out of break here uh the captain tim O'Burn usually steps in right about now for this week's edition of tim's two cents but he is busy i talked to him earlier this week and he said boy i tell you what i am swamped trying to get the next issue of working ranch magazine out so just say tell everybody hi and uh, wish him well but nevertheless i wanted to mention I, i'm kind of laughing about this because a couple of weeks ago let's see this is episode 153 so it would have been episode 151 as he was traveling through texas he was describing also about maybe that we should put together a working ranch pickup and he went through all the different uh, uh, details that that pickup would have and lo and behold wouldn't you know that i probably had more response on that than anything else that we've done not that we're overly controversial in any of our shows but nevertheless it was interesting folks really responded to that captain so maybe we need to look into a working ranch pickup up. Nevertheless, as we move forward here today, meteorologist Don Day is with us now. And Don, we always try to look out seven to 10 days, but I know in listening to your podcast last week, one of the things that you were really warning people is be cautious about these seven to 10 day forecasts. Well, yeah, there are a lot of moving parts going on right now across the globe, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, we, we've got a lot of extremes going on and uh, that is always something that is a harbinger of change down the road. And when those changes happen, uh, it's very difficult for our weather modeling, especially when you get seven, 10 to 14 days out to really be able to have any degree of confidence. But it is so available now. Weather data Mm -hmm. is so available now on the internet, on your phone, on your laptop and your, your channels on TV that always go out and try to make that 10 to 15, that 20 day forecast, which is, which is okay. But um, in these situations, you always, you always have to be really cautious and tell people, you know, I certainly wouldn't plan your vacation or your, your long haul trip across the country based on those forecasts, especially with the extremes we're seeing now. I mean, we've got extreme cold in Alaska. I mean, we're, we're talking going seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days of not getting above zero in some mm-hmm. parts of uh, Alaska, the Northwest territories, 50 below zero temperatures. And then we're going to have temperatures uh, really warming up. We've already seen that across a lot of the lower 48. And we're also seeing the development of what has been kind of what maybe to some people has been a late start to the El Nino, mm-hmm. but the El Nino is really starting to come to life in terms of at least the El Nino impacts that we see coming in the weeks ahead. Yeah. And that was something you had mentioned last week too, is as we're really now starting to see that El Nino weather pattern in our winter weather and the West Southwest is really starting to see some moisture. Yeah, we in the last week, uh, a lot of you probably heard about the heavy rains in San Diego, a lot of rain in California, parts of the Pacific Northwest. We saw some nice rains in southern Nevada, parts of uh, southern Arizona, one to two inches of rain, parts of New Mexico. Those are the areas that is 
the El Nino starts to mature as the winter goes into its mature phase. That's where we tend to see the weather beginning to pick up. Now, as you go through the rest of the winter, those areas can expand to the north and to the east of where those impacts are. And what we see developing over the next week is a very strong, energetic jet stream that goes all across the Pacific. And I mean from from Japan and East Asia all the way to the California coast. And the Pacific Ocean, we talk about it all the time, Justin. The Pacific Ocean is the largest body of water on Earth, and it's bringing a tremendous amount of water vapor and cloudiness and storminess that will be pushed from the Pacific into Western North America. And that is something we see as we get into early February. So that's going to mean a much more active pattern, especially in the West, but the South as well. Mm -hmm. And last week we had talked and you're still kind of, I know in listening to you last week, you're still even adamant that while we see some pretty good weather here for maybe a week or so, you are suspecting something could change at some point here in February. Yeah. uh, Historically, what we're seeing out in the Pacific is a harbinger of big changes about a week or so down the road. And uh, so we're we're going to see the weather do a do a flip. That's kind of how this winter has gone so far. We've we've had periods of very little weather, then all of a sudden it, it gets turned on its head. And that's what's going to happen again. Now, since it's Pacific dominated, that cold air I talked about up in in, uh, in the mm-hmm. north slope of Alaska, the Northwest Territories, Greenland. That's probably going to get locked up for a couple of weeks longer. So we don't see that severe cold entering the equation, at least in that period of time. But I think uh, by the end of February, second half of February, that's something we'll have to factor into the equation as well. So I was joking with people when they asked me about what do you think February, March, February, March into April may look like for a lot of the U.S. And I tell them, here, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Well, and uh, I'm anticipating some pretty good weather as you and I t- often talk, and I text you usually when I have fog updates here uh, in our neck of the woods. I'm anticipating April to be kind of a one of these type those type of months as well. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of winter left, and uh, it's nice to get this January thaw. I mean, it's it's very interesting human psychology. Uh, we. We have 20, 30, 40 degree below temperatures for a week. Then we have a few days that it's warmer and everybody forgot how cold it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. All right, Don, we'll appreciate it. Thanks for the outlook here and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. You can find his daily video podcast from his website at dayweather.com or his YouTube channel as well. Stay with us. We're going to talk about what's in store for the next couple of weeks here on the Working Ranch Radio Show when we come back after this. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Before we head out here today, just a couple things as I have been perusing through the latest issue of Working Ranch Magazine. It is the January, February issue. Two things come to mind. First of all, if you're in the need of buying bulls, you're going to be buying, looking at genetics this year, wanting to make some changes in your cattle herd. This is one a, kind of a one-stop shop. You can get to Working Ranch Magazine and not only can you find some great information, articles in there, I'll talk about that in just a moment, but also a pretty good list of some of the bull sales going on all across the uh, all across the country so i'd encourage you to take a look at your latest issue of working ranch magazine for that also when we're talking bulls boy there's a great article about what you need to be doing in terms of getting those bulls ready to go for breeding season a lot of good information in that about condition and mineral nutrients and things that they'll need along those lines and just getting them ready and i think you'll find that article in fact it starts on page 32 it's called prep those bulls by gilda v bryant a great article there check it out it's in the latest issue of working ranch magazine and if you don't have your subscription to working ranch magazine it's pretty simple you can go to workingranchmag.com and get your subscription started today real quick just one other thing speaking of working ranch magazine make sure you look for them down at the cattle con convention that'll be in orlando starting january 31st through february 2nd they will be there in the trade show be sure to uh, stop by the booth and say hi to the folks there at working ranch magazine be sure to tune in next 
next week as we're going to be talking water rights, but more specifically, a court case in Idaho that's being closely watched regarding water rights and the federal government and how that could have wider implications beyond just water rights for all of us in agriculture. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's ranchers. I'm Justin Mills. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.